say hello, hello, stop, stop. <laughs> if I say stop, does it work? <laughs> This is audio from a vacation film of two special people hanging out on a beach in Greece. This is Ries van Rijn. Smile. That's beautiful. And this is the famous fashion designer Jean-Paul Gaultier. How do I stop it? Where? You say stop and then no. stop. No. <laughs> no. It's the 90s. Ries and Jean-Paul are friends, lovers and co-workers. And that's actually kind of amazing because they both come from two totally different worlds. Gautier is, well, he's, he's Gautier, the epitome of outrageous, outspoken Paris fashion. Ries van Rijn, by comparison, is from a small, conservative fishing village in the Netherlands. And this is Ries's sister, Vera. We have a special connection. Ries was supposed to grow up, get married to a local girl, and become a hairdresser. Instead, he became a fashion model, Amsterdam trans icon, and a famous fixture in Europe's gay scene. He partied with Madonna, had cocktails with Freddie Mercury. You may not know his name, but Ries was the face and the body of many massive international ad campaigns. But let's just push the pause button here. This story is not about Ries or even Jean-Paul Gaultier. This story is about Ries's sister, Vera. Vera van Rijn was more than Reese's sister. She was his confidant and the keeper of his secrets. It's a story that finally takes us all the way to New Delhi, a hectic, polluted, but beautiful place. Smells, colors, and sound abound. And it's a place Vera would go to to get her life back. I'm Jonathan Gruber, and this is The Journey. The Journey is an original podcast from KLM Royal Dutch Airlines, where we meet extraordinary people whose lives are transformed by travel. Vera van Rijn lives in Volendam, a small fishing village in the Netherlands, just a 30-minute drive and a world away from the capital, Amsterdam. This is the place where she and Ries grew up. Now, Vera's apartment is exceptionally tidy in that Dutch way. The walls are white, and there's a collection of angels and other Catholic paraphernalia neatly positioned around the windows. But there's one small corner with brightly colored bells and elephants and a traditional drawing, souvenirs of India. Vera only just got back from there a few months ago. She's in her early 60s and has gone abroad before, but the trip to India was different. This was the closing chapter to a personal epic that started in the 1970s. Vera and Rhys came from a big family. My father and mother has nine children. Vera and I spoke in English, but as you can hear, she doesn't speak it every day and often falls back into Dutch. Nine kids. Which one were you? Uh, Number three. You were the third? Yeah, the first girl. The first girl. And Rhys was which one? Uh, Ruth, Sam, Vera, Marianne, Frida, Rhys. Six. He was the sixth? Yeah. Vera is 10 years older than her brother, and she practically raised him. Everyone agrees Ries's blonde curls and gentle character made him different. Really different. I bought my first lingerie, you know, a bra in a... And an underwear? Yeah. yeah. And my youngest brother, he did the dish. He made a slingshot from yes. your panties? Yeah. <laughs> he made fun of it. And I come to my bedroom, and Ries had my underwear on. So I go to my mother, and I said to my mother, Ma, I don't know. And my mother says, Sweetie, I gave him too few hormones. Vera says that when Ries was four, he would parade around in his sister's dresses and stiletto heels. He loved to go clothes shopping with Vera, sparking a lifelong interest in fashion and fabrics. 
When Reese was 10, he asked his older sister if there are men who love other men. Neither Vera nor Reese even knew the word gay. So how old were you when you realized he was gay? I think 23. You were 23. And you still didn't have a word for gay? No. As Reese grew up, Volendam became less like home. People whispered, we pray he will be normal someday. His mother even encouraged him to find a nice girl. Vera, in the meantime, became a married mother of two. She cleaned houses in Amsterdam several times a week for some extra cash. Ries came with her to Amsterdam one time and had his mind blown. Amsterdam is cosmopolitan, liberal, and free. Gay men walk the streets openly holding hands. He didn't see that in Volendam. It was just like a sponge. He saw funny people, he saw gay people. Unsurprisingly, Ries started going to Amsterdam a lot. Ries was 18, then he go one night to Amsterdam. And then he go three days in Amsterdam. And then he said to my mother, I go to live in Amsterdam. And my mother thought, yeah, that's right. He told me that he want to be free. You got all the gay bars, and he loved it. The freedom of the sex, the drugs, the transformations, the dresses, the underwears, the everything. Ries moved in with a friend from the gay scene and quickly became a fixture of the city's nightlife. Some called late 1980s Amsterdam the gay capital of the world. The great chronicler of Dutch street life, the photographer Ed van der Elsken, asked Ries and his close friends to pose for him. In one shot, Ries casts a sultry gaze into the camera. He seems perfectly at ease, perfectly cool. This photo later would symbolize this period in Amsterdam's history, freewheeling, confident, and totally unaware of what was about to happen. By this time, Vera had become a prim and proper conservative Volendam housewife and mother. But she traveled to Amsterdam every day. A friend of Ries gave her a job as a seamstress in a bespoke clothing store that had a very specific clientele. So there was a shop in Amsterdam, Guapa, and it was in that time a very famous shop. They're making clothes, uh, leather for girls, but also for prostitutes. Prostitutes? No, naughty lingerie for uh, naughty people. Sexy bras and sexy pants from leather. They also made crunchless panties. Yeah, I make also leather trousers with not the backside in. So I make assless chaps. Vera loves her days away from her husband and kids in Volendam. She loves the gossip, the tales of nightlife, the wild parties. It's a glimpse into Reese's world, a place that's extravagant and decadent. As for Reese, he got a job in a hair salon. He spent his days cutting hair, and he spent his nights indulging in Amsterdam's clubs. <laughs> There are transvestites, nudity, leather, wigs, sex and drugs. Nothing is off limits. Ries and his friend's home base was the notorious club Roxy. Joost van Bellen DJed at the Roxy and remembers Ries vividly. Ries was there a lot. I remember him standing there with all kinds of big names from fashion, from London and Paris. The Roxy was a place where lots of stars who came to Amsterdam or designers or famous people would go. Stars had to be the same like everybody else and everybody else was a star at the Roxy. There were lots of very famous people hanging out there. All of a sudden you would be standing next to Willie Nelson or football player, soccer player Maradona or I uh, remember Bono sitting beside the DJ booth. I remember... Boy George coming there, uh, Lee Bowery, the, the, the club icon, and uh, also Ries. Ries would pop by Vera's work to regale her with tales of his previous night's exploits. And then, together, they would indulge in their mutual love of clothes and fabrics. 
Vera often worked with cashmere and silk from India, and Rhys would talk about his desire to go to this magical land. If we talk about India, we talk about the clothes and the, and the silk and the colors and the, yeah, of the people. Then Vera and Rhys would dream about how they would explore India together someday. Cut to a chic street in the center of Amsterdam. Rhys is biking along when a door opens and a bleached blonde Frenchman rushes out. Stop! 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 This was the French fashion designer and gay icon Jean-Paul Gaultier, and he was instantly smitten. Gaultier had recently designed all the outfits for Madonna's Blonde Ambition Tour. You may remember the infamous Cone Bustier. This pretty much made him the most celebrated fashion designer in the world. Ries uh, worked at that time in Amsterdam and he had a modeling for Elegance. It's a magazine. And he was wearing a suit of jean Cotier. And this is Johan Weicker. He used to hang out with Ries and his friends and remembers exactly how Gautier and Ries met. And he was uh, bicycling through the Leicester Street in uh, Amsterdam. And jean Cotier was coincidentally in Amsterdam and he talked to Ries. He just said, hey, hello, hello, who are you? Vera says Gautier took Ries out for dinner. And they started dating. And they fell in love. He was proud on it. What did he uh, say to you? Oh, and then when he was to the most beautiful hotels in Paris, and then he was in New York, and then he was to Milan, and everything he told me. Yeah, he was in a dream world, in a dream world. Ries regularly traveled to Paris to be with Gautier. It was love. Ries also started getting regular work as a fashion model for photo shoots and catwalk shows. He traveled the world as Gautier's model, muse, and lover. And, of course, we tried to talk with Gautier. Well, you can, you can call back tomorrow if you want. Okay, Kai is in the meeting right now. Maybe I can take a minute. But he never got back to us. Ries's beauty and charm attracted attention everywhere they went. Ries even told his housemate that Madonna said she was attracted to him, although she certainly must have known Ries was gay. Ries would call Vera and tell her about his adventures a couple of times a week, even when he was abroad. She recalls the time Ries sat in a club next to the fashion model and mother of many of Mick Jagger's children, Jerry Hall. He told me he was once in New York and he was in a bar and just like nothing, Jerry Halls come sit with him on the table. And he said to me, I could have nothing to say. Jerry Hall, the most beautiful woman in the world. Johan Weicker was still a student then. He and a group of friends often took the train to visit Ries in Paris. We were at Gare du Nord and uh, we were picked up by a chauffeur and the car, the Rolls Royce Cabriolet, and we went through Paris to the shop of uh, Jean Cotier. And then later on we met them and we went to a bar in the evening and uh, Sophie Laura was there and all kind of French people, I don't know, but they were from cinema or artists or, well, uh, a lot of models, of course. Johan says Ries moved effortlessly through this world of international stars. After Paris, Ries arranged for them to go to the Spanish island Ibiza, where they ended up at a rather exclusive party on a yacht. We were invited on the VIP deck, so uh, there were the rich and famous people. And at that time, uh, Freddie Mercury was sitting there and Caroline of Monaco. And how did Ries behave during this? Like a fish in the water. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he liked that life. Yeah. In 1993, Ries and a group of friends filmed a vacation on the Greek island of Mykonos. Gautier was there. In the film, they're on a beach. A shirtless Gautier embraces Ries from behind. They have the same short blonde cut. They're laughing and joking. It's intimate. 
say hello, hello, stop, stop. <laughs> if I say stop, does it work? <laughs> Reese was often abroad these days, but he always saw his sister when he came home. Vera says she gobbled up his stories, vicariously enjoying his amazing, glamorous life. He told me about the people in Paris. He learned me a lot on everything that's going on. Vera is the only member of the family who got to hear all the details about Reese's jet-set life. He couldn't tell my mother. You know, my mother calls Jean-Paul Gaultier Jan-Paul Gottrui. He brought also sometimes a beautiful scar from Jean Paul Gaultier. Yeah. But she don't care. And so, as time passed, Reese became a semi celebrity and was regularly seen in the gossip sections of magazines with all kinds of famous people. He traveled the world, he saw a lot of countries, except the one he and his sister always dreamt of. Nevertheless, it seemed like a time of endless happiness. Until, rather suddenly, everything changed. AIDS, AIDS, the most frightening initials in America today. Over the last three or four years, we have seen every one of our worst predictions confirmed. It's mysterious, it's deadly, and it's baffling medical science. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome. The ravages of HIV-AIDS were reaching its peak in the mid-90s. Amsterdam's gay scene was hit hard. Johan Vikers remembers how the years of carefree partying transformed into a dark age. Another friend of mine was living in uh, Miami, uh, and he said there is a strange illness in America. Uh, Well, it's called AIDS, and all the gay people getting AIDS. Some people get also ill in uh, the Netherlands. Some of our friends or people you knew got ill. And most of the time, at that time, they were um, ashamed and you didn't see them anymore because they went back to the parents. DJ Joost van Bellen has similar memories. All of a sudden, there were more and more people missing at the dance floor. Sometimes I think during those days, losing all those people uh, was like being in a war situation. It was very scary and doomy. But on the other hand, when going out uh, at night, it was all about escapism and uh, dancing on the, on the edge of the volcano, as we say in Dutch. Vera, still working in the boutique, also saw how the virus slowly gripped Amsterdam's gay scene. People were infected or dying, and she worried about her brother. I said often to Ries, please take care. You were worried? Yeah, I knew... He has a free life. His sex life was also free. Then Ries was struck by a bout of tuberculosis. A routine blood test revealed the obvious. Yeah, he must take a blood test. And we get the results. And then I saw HIV. He, he was mad at me. And because he was mad, I knew it. I was afraid the way he's going to die. That's why I was afraid. When Rhys finally confided in Vera that he was HIV positive, he made her promise not to tell anyone, especially the family. Every time I go away, then he said to me, promise me, don't say anything at home. And I promised. And I could understand it too. Why do you think he didn't want anybody to know? Ashamed. What was he ashamed of? He lived his life so freely. Yeah, but... In that time, nobody says, I have AIDS. Rhys was afraid that his family, friends and acquaintances in Fallen Dam would avoid him, that he wouldn't be allowed to hold his nephews and nieces. Vera watched Rhys grow increasingly desperate. He tried homeopathy, herbal mixtures, whatever he could get to slow down the advancing virus. And when her family would ask about Rhys, she did what her brother told her to do. She would say... Oh, he's fine, jetting around the world, living the high life. I lied a lot. My sister-in-law, they ask often, uh, how goes Rhys? Then uh, I say, oh yeah, he's now in New York. Meanwhile, Rhys's health declined. At first, he could still work, but he quickly lost weight and was constantly coughing. 
He stopped working and quit traveling. The relationship with Jean-Paul Gaultier ended. Henri still hadn't told anyone but Vera that he was sick. He even tried to rekindle his old life in the Amsterdam nightclubs, but he grew weaker, his liver was damaged, and by the end of 1994, there was no hiding it anymore. His roommate brought Ries to the Prinzengracht Hospital. Ries's condition shocked the staff. As for Vera, her first visit with Ries in the hospital was very confrontational. What she saw was... Fear. He was afraid for everything. Everything. Ries still didn't want his family to know he was in the hospital. Vera says that even when it was clear the end was coming, he told Vera not to tell his mother. Do you think Ries knew he was approaching the end at any point? Yeah, he knew himself. And he never asked to see his mother? No. Ries was dying. Vera visited him almost every day. They'd talk, and when they would part, Ries would always say, Bye, love. They were the last words Vera ever heard her brother say. One morning, the hospital called her. Ries had died in the night. He had been in the hospital for only three weeks. Prince Grachtschikhuis, call me. Your brother is dead. This was the start of the worst period in Vera's life. Not only had she just lost her brother, her dearest friend, but it fell to her to tell the family about Ries's death. And then I must go to my mother. My mother was in shock. It quickly became clear to the family that Ries had died from AIDS and that Vera had been lying to them about it. How exactly did she react? Shock. Mad. Who was she mad at? At me. What a terrible position to be in, Vera. Yeah. To keep your promise to him and to, in a sense, betray her. Yeah, it was for them a terrible shock. Reese's funeral was a clash of two worlds. Small town laborers mingled with big city transvestites in short skirts and pink corsets. Dutch society figures attended. It was an open casket wake, and Ries had yellow roses in his hands. Vera took the roses and saved them. Vera, in the meantime, had been ostracized by the family for keeping Ries's secret. The worst thing, I was so alone. Nobody, nobody, nobody helps me. I was so alone. To deal with the loneliness and grief, Vera started drinking. When Ries is dead, I um, began to drink. I drink a lot. I was five times a year, a week drunk. And then I feel sorry, and then I was three months sober, and then, bang, then something happens, then I go to drink. Why were you drinking? To forget the pain and also the missing of this. Years pass. Vera and her husband divorced. She had little contact with her family. Vera's children grew up and moved out, making her isolation complete. Vera says she self-medicated with alcohol to manage her alienation. And then Vera reached her absolute low point in 2016. Amsterdam Stedelijk Museum held a retrospective of photographs by Ed van der Elsken. They plastered the city with posters of that remarkable photo he took of Ries and his friend on that day in the late 1980s. On a visit to Amsterdam, Vera found herself confronted by her brother, staring at her from every corner. I am often in Amsterdam, and everywhere I came, I saw pictures of Ries and his friend. She wandered through the city and found herself in front of the former building of the Prinzengracht Hospital, the place where Ries died. 
I was so in shock that I saw the picture of Ries and everything came back. I was complete mad. When I go to sleep, I got mad of the nightmares. Vera went on a bender. Then I been 14 days drunk. Vera's son was alarmed and got professional help. The psychiatrist made a quick diagnosis. You have PTSD. Post-traumatic stress disorder. Yes. I want to go to a psychologist. And he helped me. How? He listened. He said to me, there's nothing wrong with you. You must move on with your life. Give Ries a place. The therapy helped. Vera realized she needed to do something to exercise two decades of unrelenting loss and grief. To do this, she needed to take a trip. Not just any trip, the trip. The one she and Ries always dreamed about. She needed to go to India. Why? Forget him. Go on. And what I have to do was to go to India. Because we want to see that together. I thought to myself, I am now fit. I do it and I close it off. But why the trip to India? To prove myself that I couldn't. I will make a new start. You actually were sort of imagining who you were going to be when you came back. And if I can go to India in my own, then I can go further with my life. I must go on. Vera realized she needed to do this alone and to do it right now in her early 60s while she was still fit enough. She booked a trip to New Delhi and got on the plane. I sit there and there was something in the air, you know, the plane goes uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. And I thought to myself, when I do this in my own to India, then I can do anything when I go back. At last the moment arrived, the moment she and Ries had dreamed of. She was in India. I go to bed at 9 o'clock, I wake up at 6 o'clock. Every minute of the day, I've seen everything. It was great. What was the highlights? The people. They all laughing, they waving, they are friendly. The beauty of the temples, the shops in Delhi, with all the lace, with all the beautiful fabrics. Everything is beautiful. Vera was physically alone in India, but Ries was with her in spirit. Not as a haunted, painful memory, but as a companion. I thought to myself, I did it. After all those troubles. It was a relief. I was proud that I can do that. I was proud of myself. And then I thought, what have Ries thought of this? He loves it. Was that the moment that you let go of Reese yeah. there? You have your life before India, and you have your life under yeah. after India. Yeah, India oh. changed my life a lot. Vera has been completely sober since the trip. She's taken a painting, mostly religious icons. She looks after her granddaughter and is taking Spanish lessons. Vera's even planning a new trip to Varanasi in India. Devout Hindus cremate their loved ones along the ghats that line the holy river Ganges. And remember the roses Vera took from Reese's funeral? She's bringing them with her to finally put Reese to rest in the land of his dreams. (laughs) 
and then I bring the roses in Varanasi. You're going to put the three roses in the Ganges? Yeah. Oh. I still have them. Three yellow roses. Vera van Rijn. You've been listening to The Journey, an original podcast brought to you by KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. For more background on this story and to see that wonderful photo of Reese by Ed van der Elsken, go to podcast.klm.com. If you like this story, subscribe and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps other listeners find this podcast. I'm Jonathan Gruber.